Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major malware and anti-malware topics in Domain 7 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies and help you pass the CISSP exam. This is the third of six videos for Domain 7. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Let's start by defining malware. Malware is any software that is intentionally written to do something malicious or harmful to a system, a network, a device, etc. Malware is the encompassing term for all the different types of malicious software. I'm going to provide very concise definitions of the characteristics of each type of malware. And keep in mind that it is not uncommon for a piece of malicious software out there in the world to exhibit one or more of these characteristics. A virus is a piece of malware that must be triggered by the user. Worms are self-propagating as they can discover a vulnerable system, exploit the vulnerability, infect the system, and begin the process again of discovering new vulnerable systems. This allows worms to potentially spread extremely rapidly because they can self-propagate. A companion does not modify a file Rather, it creates a new file with a similar name to a commonly executed file and relies on the user accidentally executing this new malicious file. These are a much older type of malware and pretty rare these days. Macro malware are malicious code written into a macro language like VBA script for Microsoft Excel. The macro code runs within an application like Excel, which is why you get such dire warnings about opening a macro enable spreadsheet from an email. Multipartite is a piece of malware that spreads in multiple different ways. Think Stuxnet as a perfect example. It first infected via a USB stick using a USB vulnerability, and then Stuxnet spread over the local area network using a network-based vulnerability. So multipartite means a piece of malware spreads in multiple different ways. Polymorphic malware can change or morph characteristics about itself to evade detection, primarily by signature-based anti-malware scanners. Trojans mislead users of their true intent. They are disguised as legitimate software that the user would want, but they actually contain malicious code. A botnet is not a piece of malicious software, but rather multiple systems, multiple computers or devices that have been infected, allowing the systems to be remotely commanded and controlled. When harnessed together, botnets of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of these systems can send vast amounts of spam, perform distributed denial of service attacks, or mine for cryptocurrency. A boot sector infector is a type of malware that copies itself into the boot sector or master boot record of a hard drive. The malware can then run when the system is booted or started, long before any anti-malware software or many other security measures are running. This makes boot sector infectors difficult to detect and remove. Hoaxes and pranks are forms of social engineering, not code. Hoaxes are meant to be harmful, whereas pranks are just meant to be fun. Logic bombs are malware that are triggered by a certain logic or condition being met. The time of day, the day of the year, if an employee is still uh, in the HR database, etc. Some logic has to be met for the malware to be triggered. Stealth is malware that is specifically designed to evade detection by anti-malware systems. Using various active techniques, it is designed to be stealthy. Ransomware is malware that is designed to deny access to systems or files, usually by encrypting them, until a ransom is paid, typically via Bitcoin. Rootkits are malware that infect the operating system of a computer. The most nefarious rootkits are known as kernel mode rootkits, which, as the name implies, allows the malware to compromise the system kernel and gain privileged access, making rootkits exceedingly difficult to detect and remove. Spyware is malware that allows an attacker to gain information about a computer system, to spy on it, and adware causes all sorts of pop-ups and advertisements. Finally, data diddlers. This is malware specifically designed to diddle with data, to make small changes over a long period of time to evade detection. A type of data diddler is a salami attack, 
which specifically targets financial transactions. For example, shaving fractions of a penny off of many transactions. That's a salami attack, a type of data diddler. A zero day is a vulnerability in a system that is at first unknown to the defenders, those that would patch or configure the system to protect it. Zero days are particularly dangerous because they are flaws that are being exploited before anyone knows to detect and remediate the vulnerability. And this term zero day applies to any of the types of malware that we've just discussed. A zero day means it's day zero of its spread. No one knows about it yet. Now, let's talk about how we prevent, detect, and defend our systems against these various types of malware. We first need a policy that states that we need anti-malware systems and software, clearly defines roles and responsibilities for users, and training and awareness for them. Why training and awareness? As I mentioned, a virus must be triggered by a user. So one form of anti-malware is not actually systems or technology, but rather making our users aware of what malware is and training them not to open those macro-enabled Excel files that our stranger sends them. Ideally, we want to prevent malware from infecting our systems. One method of doing so is whitelists. We create a list of programs that are allowed to run on the system, a whitelist, and any software that is not on the whitelist like malware, is not allowed to be installed and executed on the system. Network segmentation is about separating our network into segments and then controlling the flow of traffic between segments, potentially preventing the spread of malware like worms. Now, in the less than ideal situation that we haven't prevented malware from getting on a system, let's talk about how we can detect malware. The type of malware scanners most commonly used to detect malware are signature-based scanners. Signatures define unique patterns for a piece of malware. Anti-malware vendors are constantly looking for the latest, greatest malware out there in the wild, and whenever they discover new malware, they write a new signature to identify the malware. And then, when customers update their scanners, their anti-malware systems, they will download the latest and greatest signatures. Signature-based scanners have a significant weakness. They can only detect what they have signatures for, which means they need to be constantly updated and that signature-based scanners cannot detect zero-day malware because there's no signature exists yet. This is why we have heuristic scanners. Heuristic scanners do not use signatures. Rather, they evaluate a piece of software to try to determine if it is malicious. They do this in a couple of different ways. Static heuristic analysis is where the static source code is analyzed. And dynamic heuristics is where a potentially malicious program is run in a sandbox environment and monitored to see if it does anything suspicious. Heuristic scanners are very susceptible to false positives, but they have a very big advantage of being potentially able to identify zero-day malware. Activity monitors look at running processes on a system, running programs. Activity monitors are very much a last line of defense as the malware will need to have installed itself and be currently running for an activity monitor to detect it. But hey, defense in depth, it may be a good idea to have an activity monitor. And change detection. A lot of malware will make changes to certain system files, like configuration files. Change detection is about monitoring key system files for changes. So we hash the files we want to monitor for changes and then rehash the files periodically to see if the hash values differ. If they do, it means a change has been made to the file and we might have malware on our system. Finally, as I mentioned, most anti-malware solutions are signature based, which means that it is critically important we constantly, continuously update our scanners with the latest, greatest signatures so we can detect the latest malware. And that is an overview of malware within Domain 7, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'll provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and all the best in your studies.